since we're talking about shell work or enconchados, we need to kind of shift then to the image of the Virgin that's in here. I originally had asked to have the original image of the Virgin that is associated with its apparition to Juan Diego on the tilma, which is in the Basilica of the Virgin in Mexico City. Uh, but they weren't able to get copyright permission. Uh, the thing is, you don't need copyright permission to reproduce that image. So I'm hoping that at some point they're able to uh, incorporate the image into the image set, because that, that's really the image I wanted to use uh, as an example of religious imagery, but also the Virgin of Guadalupe is central uh, as a founding myth uh, for Mexico. I show my students do you? That'd be great. No, yeah, if you can bring it in in your classes, please do. That's really the image that I want to focus on. But since we have this enconchado image, uh, I want to talk a little bit about religious images and continue the conversation about shell inlay. So when we talk about religious images, uh, there are three general types that we see in colonial art. There are devotional images, like the virgin image. These are like the single images of saints or Christ or Mary that are meant to ins um, inspire or guide prayer and meditation. Then we have narrative illustrations like scenes from the life of Christ or scenes from the life of Mary. The, these follow their, 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 their exploits, their events through the course of their life. And then we have allegorical images. They're more like symbolic images of like the Christ passion or things of that sort. And then enconchado, the term I already introduced you to, which means shell inlay. This is the image, of course, uh, by Miguel Gonzalez, who's a member of the Gonzalez family we we're talking about. Uh, the Virgen of Guadalupe from around 1698, oil on canvas, on wood, with shell inlay. And here you can see how the artist carefully uses the shell to kind of enhance sort of the reflective quality of the shell. You know, this is one of the things that really appealed, I think, to local audiences. If you think about sort of the native valuation of reflective surfaces and iridescence, like in the feathers and feather painting, the, you can see how this kind of iridescent quality would have appealed to a local aesthetic, especially when it's combined with holy images or sacred images. And here he uses the shell to comprise the body of the Virgin, as well as for other details like the little frames that depict different scenes from the story of her apparition. This image is very different from the original image. The original image is a devotional image. It's this is just the image of the Virgin. Uh, iconographically, the Virgen de Guadalupe is related to a genre of Virgin or Marian representation known as the apocalyptic Virgin. There are different versions of the apocalyptic Virgin Virgin <laughs> and the Virgen de Guadalupe uh, uh, kind of belongs to that genre of Marian iconography, the apocalyptic virgin. She's an apocalyptic virgin. If you ever see like an image of the virgin taking central space, floating up in the heavens, uh, it belongs to this Marian iconographical language of the apocalyptic virgin. This one's different because we do see the, the Virgin in the center, but she's uh, surrounded by four images that are different episodes in the story of her apparition. So when she appears to Juan Diego, uh, she tells him to go to the Archbishop, Sumarraga. Uh, Sumarraga doesn't believe him. He goes back. Uh, he asks for some kind of miracle. Uh, there's one image that's missing. There are actually five events in the story, but the artist got rid of the fifth one because it doesn't fit, <laughs> just to use the four corners. The image that always gets left out is, uh, Juan Diego had an uncle who was dying. Then the virgin appears to the uncle and heals him. So that becomes a miracle. But that's left out of here. What we see is the virgin appearing to Juan Diego, him going to Juan de Sumarraga, him going back to the virgin, and then going back to the bishop. And this time that's when the roses fall out of his mantle and the image of the virgin is impressed on his mantle. That's the miracle. Okay? And that's what convinces Sumarraga that she actually did appear to him, and that's when he constructs the first uh, uh, temple to her, the first shrine, right at the spot where she appeared. <coughs> so this can be considered like a cross between a devotional and a narrative image. Also the framework, it's lacquered. Again, this is something coming out of Japanese or Asian art influences, the use of lacquer and inlay. There's a lot of inlay, not just of shell, but of other types of wood as well. Uh, for enconchados, there should be like a blurb for AP, on AP, a website, but you can, uh, there hasn't been any like sustained study on this. There are very few pieces that we have. How do they know that? About, I look at that. Oh, no, for, for the Virgin, there's a ton written. There are oodles and oodles of books. Uh, if you're interested in reading more about the Virgin iconography, which would be very helpful with this, you should look at the work of Jeanette Peterson. You know, Jeanette, J-E-A-N-E-T-T-E, -T -T -E, Jeanette Peterson, P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N. 
Uh, she published a book just recently, a couple years ago, called Visualizing the Virgin. She's like the foremost expert on uh, virgin iconography. And she's published a few other articles as well that I think you might find useful. But in terms of enconchado as a technique, there's not that much written about it. Uh, my, the, your best bet would be to look at exhibition catalogs that have enconchado works in them and like little blurbs, little entries. But yeah. Story that could easily yeah. Yeah. Easily. It's easy. Yeah. With number one, of course, being. Mexico. Yeah. So, was that why you wanted the Virgin in Guadalupe to originally put in and not this one? Yeah, I, I didn't want. I wouldn't have included any in Conchado because it's not a dominant form. You know, with only six images, you know, I wanted to include works that were really representative. You know, of a larger body of material. Uh, that's why for the biombo, it would have been one of the painted biombos, like the one at Denver. And I wanted the Virgin image because we didn't have any religious images from the colonial context, and that's the most important one. It's iconic, you know. Yeah, I did the same thing. I included yeah. it when we Good. discussed it, but and I wondered why we weren't mm -hmm. doing that one and this one. It's because the College Board's a stickler, and if you can't get a copyright permission, they don't want to publish it. They don't want to get sued. But like I said, uh, anybody can publish. I just did in my book. That we can enjoy. I talked to Jeanette. She's like, oh yeah, you can publish it as long as it's not defamatory. As long as it's respectful and scholar, da da da. And yeah, I don't have any problems. I mean, she's been publishing the image. Other people have been publishing. You don't need permission. But I don't know how flexible College Board would be with that. I mean, you can write to the Basilica to your blue in the face, and they're not going to respond, you know. But um, yeah, that's the issue with the Virgin. But having the original makes it nice because you can yeah. make that connection with other pilgrimage sites. We sure. Have, like, like that's a very good point. That's another reason I actually pulled this up too, because I thought one of the things that we integrated into the framework for the new curriculum, if you noticed, is comp comparisons, both cross-culturally and trans-historically. You know, so thinking about what are the kinds of themes. Well, there's portraiture, you know, there's architecture, but the whole pilgrimage issue, you know, really brings an interesting question into it. And you can draw from other uh, categories, as you were noting. That would be an excellent way to use the Virgin of Guadalupe, which is one of the reasons I wanted it incorporated. But I said we'd run into that copyright problem. So I'm hoping at some point they can change the Biombo and the Virgen de Guadalupe, but we'll see. And here's the, a very bad image of the original that's uh, on display at the Basilica of the Virgin in the north part of Mexico City. Uh, Jeanette Peterson thinks she might have identified the artist. I mean, because according to the story, it just appears miraculously. These kinds of images that just appear out of the blue, out of divine sort of intervention, there's like a long Greek word that we use. A-C-H. E I R O P O E I T I C, a chiropoietic. That word refers to images that uh, appear spontaneously because of divine, they're of divine creation, divine manufacture. So th this image, which is on a mantle, was supposedly, it appeared miraculously on Juan Diego's mantle. Uh, he uh, opened his mantle, roses fell out, and there's the image. And that was the miracle to convince the archbishop that this actually had occurred and to build a shrine to her at the site of her apparition, her appearance. <laughs> You're right. That's, that, was, that was miraculous. There, you know, not, there are no roses locally. You know, that was part of the miracle. <laughs> it's also during winter, you know, and they appear. So there are all these miracles associated with the apparition. But this is the image, and, it's, uh, and Jeanette Peterson's done a lot of work on the image, and she thinks she's identified the native artists who painted this. So if you read Jeanette Peterson, you can get more information about this particular image. Uh, here I just, meant unidenti I'm, I just added unidentified artists. Uh, the years have changed from 1535 to 1555. There's a little kind of, uh, it's not precise, but it's somewhere in the early to mid 16th century. <clears throat> Oil and temper on cloth. The cloth, uh, the mantle is known as a tilma. That's what that term, that's the, name, that's the Nahuatl word for the mantle that he was wearing. It's a tilma. And this is currently located in the basilica. You can go, and they have a conveyor belt in front of it, because they don't want people just standing there. So you stand, and it's like, you can see it. <laughs> yeah, it's a little cheesy. But otherwise, people would be in front of it forever. Um, but in any case, but it's clearly like a Renaissance image. It, it, it's, la its visual language is associated with Renaissance, Marian iconography. So like I said, to learn more about this, definitely look at Jeanette Peterson's work, you know, her book and then her publications. And there are others who have written about it. Like I said, there's a huge body of scholarship on the Virgin. It's actually quite overwhelming to sift through. So Peterson's a good place to start. 
Uh, there are variations that shell uh, uh, image is related to this particular composition. This is Miguel Cabrera's uh, version, one of his paintings. He, he was a Marian. He was a, a really uh, faithful follower uh, of this Marian devotion. He was a Guadalupano. Uh, he was a painter working in the mid-18th century in Mexico City. He's like the superstar of the 18th century. And uh, he uh, painted numerous versions of the Virgen, and this is one of them. Uh, that has the four apparitions. That are more. They're, they're, I, I wanted to show you this uh, as a painted example of that same composition, and it's also clear. It's more legible. You can see the uh, episodes more clearly rendered in this painting. And those of us who grew up Catholic, we all had lithographs of this in our home. <laughs> I grew up with this image in my home. Yeah, we all have images of the Virgen in our home. We have little altars. And this is just another example of uh, an enconchado. You know, it's, it's, uh, this is uh, Juan Correa, the artist who painted that screen with the liberal arts and the elements. His brother was an artist as well. I mean, because we don't have an academy yet. The academy is not founded to 1780s. So we have the workshop system with master and apprentice. So it's very common for artists to train their children, especially their sons. Although there's a suggestion that girls were taught to. Uh, that's a whole area that needs more work. But, uh, um, uh, so Nicolás was Juan Correa. Juan Correa is the superstar. Nicolás is not as famous, but he was an artist as well. And this he did Enconchado. This is uh, of a series, scenes from the life of Christ. It's a narrative illustration, the wedding at Cana. And these works are spectacular. I mean, they're visually just stunning. This, like, you don't even get a sense. Uh, he uses different kinds of shell. One, of it, one kind of shell looks golder and one looks silvery. And look how precise he uses this for like the, the decorative elements, almost like lace work. You know, when you look at this, it just shimmers. How big is that? Uh, it's about this big. Yeah, I've seen this work. It can't get too big. You know, you're dealing with like small pieces of shell, so they're usually about this big. The size. Uh, this one, I'm not sure where it is. The, some of these are in collections in Mexico, and I think uh, I don't. I think there are a couple in the U.S. There aren't that many, you know, that we have that are publicly. I'm sure a lot of these are in private people's homes. Yeah, that's another issue with colonial art is that uh, so much of it tends to focus on religious art, but that's because so many of the museums that have colonial art uh, have colonial painting because when they, the museums are being founded, they pretty much raided the churches and monasteries. They didn't have any money, so the collections uh, are formed by work that was accessible and uh, uh, free. Um, and uh, non-religious works like portraits and biombos are in people's homes. People, there's not a philanthropic tradition in Mexico or Latin America like we have here. I think this has to do with the, the history of economic instability and political unrest. People hold on to their possessions and just bequeath them you know, to their children and to their children. So these things stay in the family. I've been to homes in Mexico City where I see colonial paintings in the dining room and pre-Hispanic vessels in the living room and their homes are just filled with this kind of material. <clears throat> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so uh, there, are very, there are a few examples that are publicly accessible, and I think most of these are in Mexico, but I think there are a couple here in the US. They're very rare, but uh, just to kind of give you another example of what the use of shell can be used for. I mean, it's just really quite a stunning uh, type of, of work. <laughs> 